being a CEO or like a senior leader in a company, it can be a lonely place. Me alluded to it earlier. You just look around and go, who can I actually speak to about some of this stuff? I think that's actually where angel investors can really come into their own. Welcome back to our 40 Minute Mentor, Where Are They Now? feature series, in which we catch up with some of our most popular 40 Minute Mentors from previous series. Next up, I'm joined by James McClure, an experienced C-level tech exec, angel investor, advisor, and executive coach. After eight years at Google, James joined Airbnb as GM for the UK and Northern Europe, overseeing their growth across homes and launching experiences. Most recently, he was CCO at Adzuna, a global search engine running their business across 16 markets. In today's episode, James and I will chat about his experience as a solopreneur, an angel investor, and the brilliant online courses he started teaching. James, welcome back to 40 Minute Mentor. How are things? Yeah, thanks very much for having me back. It's uh, there's like when you have those retired footballers and you go, oh, right, you know, I wonder what, I know, Thomas Sorensen is doing now. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Sorensen, as a very proud slash often depressed Aston Villa fan. That is another one of our former players. I think Torrance Johnson did a bit that, but it's very niche, niche well, reference. I James. can give you the answer. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's, he's been on the, uh, the, the Australian uh, World Cup, World Cup punditry. So that, that's, what, that's why I've been thinking about him more than I had done for the previous 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. And that's very apt, isn't it? Because since you've been on the podcast, you have moved down under to Australia. So uh, I hope you and your family are settling in well. You last came on uh, 40 Minute Mental back in Series 3. We're now heading into Series 9. So a lot has happened since. So can you update our audience a little bit on, uh, yeah, how life has changed and what's been keeping you busy? Yeah, just any news. Yeah, the two big bits are obviously living in Australia now. Like my wife's Australian, so combination of uh, COVID and a bunch of things when you're in an international relationship. Someone's always compromising, so it's um, my turn to moved down to Australia, I've lived there before, so not too much of trouble. Uh, the other one is I've become a dad. So I've got uh, now coming up to 18 month year old son called Robbie. So those are the, the two big ones. And to us, like, we've been thinking about moving back to Australia for a while. And then with my son coming along and decided to take a bit of uh, time off parental leave, which just effectively meant that I ended, ended the role like with, uh, with Adzuna, just because if I knew I was going to move to Australia, taking a bunch of time off and then coming back for like a couple of months isn't going to help anyone. But it actually was quite a fortunate thing to do. So my son was born like prematurely, he was in intensive care for like for a few weeks and then out of hospital the first six months. He's in pretty good shape now. Coming on to what I've been doing lately, it was a somewhat not usual start to a sort of solo career and building full together bits of portfolio. But there were actually some, like obviously the great benefit of being able to spend time to support like my, my wife and son through it all. But I think also just the time to kind of, take a bit of a step back and think through some areas. And so what I've been doing, and it started with kind of maybe a couple of hours a week, and now I'm probably up to two to two and a half days a week of stuff is really around like things I enjoy and what have been big parts of my career in the past. So it's how do you go from zero to one and one to 10 in businesses? And that's come in a few different forms. So one's been uh, coaching, so coaching either founder CEOs or like, you know, sort of senior execs in, in growth companies. Or another side has been angel investing. And that's what's turned into like scouting for VC firms. So bringing together, I guess, combining some of the people that I see where some interesting stuff and then hopefully being able to help as, as an investor or at least connect them to other forms of capital. And what that has more recently turned into is I'm now doing some like online courses, so cohort-based learning, one which is around uh, scaling scaling your authority by influence. So very much a bit like our Series 3 conversation of how do you get stuff done when you're not in HQ and a bunch of other tips and tricks like that. And another one of like how to angel invest for busy tech execs. So effectively, that's the what I wish I knew two years ago and to try to help people avoid some of the mistakes that I made, but also actually sort of helping to show where some of the opportunities are and something that's seen as quite inaccessible. 
Amazing. There's been uh, ups and downs over the last couple of years, but um, many congratulations on the new arrival and the, the relocation down under. You can already see how much impact the work you've been doing is, is having. It doesn't surprise me that you've made a success of your solopreneur life and, and those sorts of tips and tricks. Even from our first conversation, it was clear that it's something you're very, very good at. And it's definitely a, a theme we're seeing amongst tech operators founders is getting involved in angel investing but i'd imagine it, it does feel like a yeah like a, a big topic to undertake and something that, that a lot of people probably would like some support on so i can totally understand why you're doing it can you tell us a bit more about the journey that you've been on over the last couple of years what have been some of your biggest learnings is there anything you'd do differently if you were to do it again i think what i'd do differently is i'd get started on i'd be more active on social media earlier than i have done so I think that I probably, what I've learned is that I think I overestimated how interested people I don't really know would be in the stuff that I'm doing, but I underestimated how interested people I already know are in what I'm doing. So as an example of that, of uh, like I'm doing the first angel investing course, so the people that have actually you know, put money in their pockets to listen to me bang on about something, it includes someone that was my housemate in Singapore someone I went on a snowboarding holiday with, someone that I nearly hired for a job they pulled out the process, someone that I've worked with, someone that I didn't end up coaching, but we got on quite well. So that's just sort of to give an example that I, mean, I haven't been away so far that I've lost my British embarrassment about stuff, so much so that I would have felt almost embarrassed when I had people. When I, saw, when I woke up to see the email notification come in of these people, I was like, Oh man, like uh, that's really kind of quite humbling or surprising. So I think that's one bit like that I really underestimated how much people that you already know are actually quite interested in what you do. And that actually it's been through being more active on particularly like LinkedIn and like trying to produce some of my own content has helped me realize that actually I've had a lot of people just mention the stuff that I've been doing, even if they're not necessarily like that interested at the moment as a customer. But it's just building up future bits of business. I imagine, you know, as someone who's been on the creator game far longer, I can imagine that's something that you recognize as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those funny things. I think a lot of people probably think that I love and have always been good at posting regularly and creating content. And the reality is that that's not the case at all. I really only started in the pandemic and had huge imposter syndrome about writing stuff and was continually thinking people would hate what I was talking about. And then just like you said, you suddenly realize actually people are a bit more interested than you think. And then then almost it becomes like, oh, actually, I really should keep this going because this is, this is adding value and it's useful. And so, and then it, then it kind of, you get on a bit of a hamster wheel with it. And then before you know it, you're posting most days and it's a big part of the business. So I've definitely seen that. I absolutely love what you've been up to. And as, as it sounds like it's been a journey, a voyage of discovery. For anyone else that's listening, that's uh, maybe working on a side hustle, thinking about taking the, a leap into doing something full-time, maybe doing off the side of a desk. Like, do you have any particular advice that you'd share with them? I think one of the ones that, again, something I just didn't, wasn't expecting getting into it is I think, you know, I'm not someone that's actually necessarily particularly extroverted uh, and things, but I, one thing is the solo bit, I actually really miss the, being part of a team and working on similar stuff consistently with the same group of people. I've had a huge amount of variety of you know, speaking to different founders and helping like different businesses in, you know, I might speak to someone once every week, I might speak to someone once every month or, you know, as necessary on WhatsApp. But I thought it's not quite the same as being part of a team. So I'd certainly think, certainly for like, people who derive a lot of energy from being in the office and see other people, Think about how you can try and replicate some of that in your solopreneur gig, especially if you would be doing it in a more remote setting than, you know, like, than if you're in the same location as a lot of the things that you would be doing as a solopreneur. So that's probably one of the lesser mentioned bits of, of like advice to these ones is really try and take care of your social involvement and the kind of the, probably the depth of relationship as well as the, the breadth. I think the other one that I'd give as advice is, especially if you've already started doing some things, I think trying to work out what having multiple potential revenue streams that are linked by common themes is the 
better chance for success because I would say that if I was purely trying to do the coaching side, I'd be spending a lot of time banging out random e- emails to people trying to drum up business. But if you've got that as something which is, let's say, like quite, you know, it's quite a high price thing further down the funnel if you think in marketing terms, but that there's some of the courses that I could do or even just, you know, following on social media is a little bit of an entry level, then I mean, think of the different ways you've got to be able to monetize. And as long as you've got a relatively consistent or like ideal customer profile, you've got, so mine is either kind of like founders on one side of great angel investments. And then on the other side, it's sort of tech execs who either would be interested in learning angel investing or interested in coaching or would be want to be connected to those founders then you've got a good route to bring together you know your an, enough of your own business to be able to be successful in the future so is it difficult because like typically my advice in most things is focus really hard down onto a niche so i think the key is to be niche on an audience but i think fairly like liberal in actually what's the best way for you to interact with them and particularly you know, at the end of the day how to monetize that audience great advice james thank you i really hope you're enjoying today's episode so far but before we continue hearing from today's mentor i wanted to take a minute to give a shout out to our series sponsors alchemist alchemist is an industry leading learning and development company using immersive and interactive experiences to help increase employee engagement levels of happiness and achievement across your teams and overall productivity Alchemist presents L&D departments with an opportunity to innovate and be bold in their approaches to blended learning. If you love the sound of this as much as we do here at JBM, then head over to thisisalchemist.com forward slash 40 minute mentor to learn more. And now back to our 40 minute mentor. And I guess we've we've alluded to it. We've been teasing our audience somewhat with the a uh, bit about the, the online courses you've started delivering on angel investing and increasing your impact as a tech exec. Can you share a little bit more about what you've been uh, doing on that front and uh, and how people might be able to get involved or what they could expect to take away from it? Yeah, so there's two different courses on two different platforms. So one is uh, like scaling your authority uh, via influence, which is basically based off an internal training course that I did in an Airbnb. So I had a bit of content prepared, but it was with a, a company called CoLeap and they provide cohort-based learning. And they're very focused on tech leadership management training skills. And then the second one is how to angel invest for busy tech execs. And that's on a platform called Maven, which is a US, US-based one. That's a bit more broad of, you know, like I was on in my like learning group for that, there were people who were doing how to grieve better, you know, after like a loss. Uh, there was, you know, like how to do financial modeling. There was product management. There was a whole bunch of different things in there. So I think for how to get involved, I mean, to us, like you can actually just apply to do them. I mean, for the Maven one, I just applied to do it. And I think it's one of those ones where it was like an apply, but they pretty much let any, anyone in because I don't think it was that rigor. It was more of they wanted to make sure you were interested to to do it. I think what's good about these is that they, a lot of the, well, okay, for Coley, they produce a lot of the content based on the stuff I've suggested. Maven, I've actually done it all like from scratch on like, like writing landing page copy and all this other stuff, which I hadn't done before. It's, it's, just, it's been quite a good learning um, in itself. So I think they're really good routes in to do something for, you know, I think this could be, these ones could be run twice a year, three times a year. And so it's quite a set up cost. But once you, I think once you can get going, I can see future ones being relatively straightforward to run it's more just the marketing and like improving the things i think what i've actually got from the sessions that i've run so far is the benefit of the of the cohort setup so meaning that you're on like live sessions uh, like for the angel one it's like three 90 minute sessions and then there's in between like a slack style community and bits of work that i think what i've been surprised about is that the connections between the actual attendees have become quite strong and I think there's actually a lot good amount of like networking opportunities that come off that as well as what you learn through it. And I think that you know, there's people are becoming more, I think the certificates that you can learn from some of these is starting to or continue to replace a lot of the more 
classic management training that you would have you know, you, earlier in our careers would have sat in a room and you've got 20 people and some facilitator talking about how to manage. I think these ones where it's actually, je- like even though it's rem- even though you're all remote, you know, living rooms or studies, it's actually more interactive than a lot of those sort of sit down type ones that I've sort of seen before. I'm not surprised by that. We've seen, I think, with our own SOS community that we've built in the last couple of years uh, from some of the sessions we've run online, it's actually as much about bringing interested parties together who have a kind of common interest in the topic. And, and we've seen lots of great friendships and partnerships and connections developing off the back of it. And I think that's a really, that's a really great thing. I think as somebody that set up my business early in my career, I often yearn, I think, for that sort of learning, you know, in a slightly more uh, intimate setting where you can speak to like-minded folk and collaborate on certain certain stuff. I think it's, it's, it's really powerful. I know angel investing, you know, is something you've been doing for a while and, and this is part of the course. And it's something that we hear a lot of people asking us about and it's, we've kind of touched on it over the course of the, the last couple of years. But what have been your biggest lessons that you've learned from being an angel investor and and do you have any advice for anyone listening to this that is kind of keen to start out on that journey i think the most surprising bit is that the price of entry is not as high as you think so it is an expensive thing to do for you know if you think of like an average wage in the uk what is it like 35 like thirty thousand pounds in london or, or something like it is a large thing to do and i certainly wouldn't suggest you should Go into it assuming you're going to lose all your money and that anything that comes out of it is a benefit, but that you get suggested that like it's minimum twenty five thousand to invest, or often it's like fifty to a hundred, and those are like, do I feel confident enough with like a large amount of money on this idea and these two people? Typically, that answer ends up being no, unless you're dealing with other people's money or you've got so much that you're not so worried about it, and you can really play the wider game, but you can make investments for £1,000 or US dollars in early stage businesses and actually like be a part of helping them to grow. So certainly, you know, that's still a significant amount of money. But you know, if you think of someone who's like in the higher tax bracket in the UK, that as a proportion of what they may invest or save, it starts to become affordable. So number one, it is accessible then i think number two it's that it's easy to overestimate your own ability to pick deals i think what i've tried to focus on as i've got more experience in it is focusing to what types of deals am i seeing so where is the deal flow coming from rather than and then if i'm just picking decently from a good selection of stuff that's actually far better than me trying to pick the best things that i might see from the people that randomly email or connect with me on on social media. So that's where I try and be actually quite proactive on some of the things. So I, thought, I will actually just do stuff like if I see there's a product I've started using or some something I feel is interesting, I will just send like a cold email or LinkedIn to a CEO and go, hey, Mr. Ormus CEO, what you're doing is really cool. Here's, here's a couple of ideas I've got. Interested to chat. P.S. Are you raising anytime soon? And sometimes they're not. Uh, but like the way that you can get in for a low amount of money is where you're actually you're showing you're interested, you're getting something out of it. And if you're in a, and particularly if you're in an area that you've got expertise in yourself, then you can be useful to the founder. And you can be, you know, but my goal is always that I want to be the best value bit of money that they raise comes from me. So I'm I'm not coming in with thousands and thousands of stuff, but. You know, I'll work pretty hard for the, in, the investment that I make and that they've got the opportunity to get a good amount of access. And so that's why I look to invest in things that are either I'm interested in or hopefully I've got sort of good amount of domain expertise on. Yeah, I love that. And I, I guess it, it links quite nicely to my penultimate question, which is for any founders that are listening, why should they consider angels over the more traditional VCs? What, what are some of the, the other benefits? I think in, in general, in terms of the ideal is that you've got balance of of the two because obviously the benefits of vc is they've got bigger check amounts to go but i think for having angels as part of your mix i think you most angels not so all but most are operators and will have some domain expertise so you can call upon their background history and advice plus their networks and i think the one of the biggest ones is that versus 
VC is, I think it's actually like empathy. Not to say that VCs don't have any empathy. Some of my best friends are, are in VC, but the majority of VCs aren't from an operator background, whereas the majority of angel investors will be. And so that means that when I speak to a founder and they go, man, like I just got rinsed at the board meeting, you know, investor X from this, just I don't think they get it. They don't like what we're doing. Not necessarily that I've got any better ideas, but I can go, yeah, Matt, been there. I know it sucks. Someone who looks at your business for whatever, an hour every two months doesn't agree with what you're doing. So I think actually it's the, yes, there's like networks and expertise and benefits, but I think it's the benefit of angels that you develop a good relationship with is that it's kind of like having, it's a bit of like having an advisor, but it's part of the cap table and understands the business. And, you know, being a CEO or like a senior leader in companies, it can be a lonely place. Me alluded to it earlier. You just look around and go, who can I actually speak to about some of this stuff? I think that's actually where angel investors can really come into their own because they're not, you know, there's no other games being played on that. It's like, you know, this is their experience and they're here to, here to help. Yeah, very true and great advice. I think getting that blend right is, is, is really important as a founder between VC and angel. And there are some, yeah, having somebody that's been there and done it or kind of can empathize with you, I think as a founder is, is, is super important. So thank you, thank you for sharing, James. Sadly, we're at an end here, but finally, I wanted to ask what you're most looking forward to in, in 2023, because I know 2022 has been a transformational year, but I know that 2023 is likely to be uh, even more exciting. So fill us in on uh, what you've got in store. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, 2022 has been starting up a lot of things, but it's also felt a little bit like being in a waiting room or departure lounge because we were looking to move for a while and then, you know, bits of like Sun's Health and a few other things meant we didn't get to Australia as soon as we were uh, expected. So I feel like it's all fully arrived, fully set, going to be getting into like Australian lifestyle as a, as a family is really what I'm looking forward to. And I think from you know, what we talked about earlier, that I think what I've missed from individual business or the solopreneur side is that like, wider feeling of team and i think that's something that um, i'm confident it's going to change pretty soon into 2023 there'll be a more regular set out of being with people that you know you've got the, the same shared goals and dreams on a regular basis rather than on a more regular basis brilliant james thank you so much for um coming back on the podcast it's always a pleasure seeing you i'm really excited so i hope we'll be able to catch up at some point again before too long um, i know you're a little bit further away this time but um very excited for what's in store. And um, yeah, thank you for coming back on, sharing your mentorship with our listeners once again. It's always a pleasure having you on. Uh, my pleasure. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's great, great to be back. And yeah, it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to see how the podcast has grown. And it, definitely in that imposter syndrome, you look at the guests you've got on now and go, I'm glad I was in early. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not at all. Your episode has always been incredibly popular. And thank you for your kind words. And thank you for all the support you've given um, myself, JBM, and the podcast over the over the years. It's, it's, it's really, really appreciated. We all wish you the very best of luck for 2023, James. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. We are currently working on exciting new ways to partner with mission-driven companies to help you raise your employer brand and attract high-quality talent and customers. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can sponsor 40-Minute Mentor, please drop our producer and head of marketing an email on hannah at jbmc.co.uk. Thanks again for tuning in, and I hope to see you again next week for a fresh dose of mentorship.